And uh, let's now hear more from historian Mark Armand. Here, he joins us now live from Oxford. Uh, Mr. Armand, welcome. So we've seen a rise in nationalism during these riots in Kiev. Uh, can the moderate opposition do anything to control the more extreme elements once the crisis is over? Well, we, we'll have to see. I suspect the problem is that the so-called moderate opposition has rather wanted something of this sort. If we think about why the Orange Revolution went wrong in 2004 and 5, it was precisely that the mass protests were peaceful, they led to a rerun of elections, but although Mr Yanukovych lost, he lost very narrowly and he remained a viable political player with a very large body of support and won, of course, the elections in 2010. So for the opponents of Yanukovych, the recognition that if you simply force fresh elections, you don't fundamentally change the political system. They want to marginalize and relegate Yanukovych and his party of the regions, his supporters. So you need a, a non-constitutional revolution. Remember, one of the opposition television stations is now headlined, Revolutia, the revolution station. So, for instance, uh, Vitaly Klitschko has spoken with a forked tongue. When he talks in English or German to the media, he talks about the need for peaceful protests, the need for fresh elections. But he then says to his own supporters, Yanukovych is like Ceausescu or Gaddafi. If you say that the president of Ukraine is like Gaddafi, what are you saying? You're saying he's a dictator who should be lynched, as Gaddafi was in 2011. So there is a danger that, in fact, the extreme right that does exist, the extreme nationalist and, indeed, neo-Nazi elements, are actually, in a sense, serving the political purpose of the apparently moderate leaders when they speak to the Western media. That is to say, they want to overthrow the existing state. They don't trust elections because they fear, even if they win elections, there is a sufficiently big body of support for Yanukovych that his political movement would survive and come back again, as it did after the failures of the Orange Revolution, after the infighting amongst the leaders then. Mm. And uh, we're seeing that nationalist parties and movements are a big part of the protest, and they seem to be allied with yeah. liberals could they share power if the current leadership goes? Well, of course, this is, a, this is a dangerous situation. I think myself that the so-called liberals and moderates are playing with fire, although they want collapse of Yanukovych's government and a, 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 a revolution of a sort. They, of course, then want to glide safely into the presidential office, into the prime minister's office and into the seats of power. But, of course, they will have depended upon the heavy mob, these extreme nationalists from the Western Ukraine who chant anti-Russian slogans, anti-Jewish slogans, and who, of course, have got a taste for violence, and who will see themselves, if they are able to overthrow Yanukovych, as the people who brought about the revolution. And, of course, we've seen in the past, once you move from having elections as the basis of political power to the crowd in the street, to the storming of the government buildings, that can slide out of control. The people who think they are the leaders today could find themselves marginalized. The people who today are willing to use incitements to violence by denouncing the current government as being tyrants and dictators could find themselves being targeted by the same people who are throwing the Molotov cocktails today, tomorrow. So it's a very dangerous and unstable situation. And I think uh, Vitaly Klitschko, Yatsenyuk, Poroshenko, these leaders who the West courts are playing with fire. But so is the West. Uh, the US and the EU, of course, played their role in these uh, protests. Uh, so we saw uh, their officials on Independence Square there. Uh, the latest announcement from Washington, hmm. uh, we see now that it is revoking visas and, the, and uh, that the everyday words of support we hear from Brussels as well. Isn't that fueling the, rev the revolution there as well? It is. I, I think it's a rather sinister sign, not only for the politics of Ukraine, that the democratic countries of the European Union and the United States, their governments and the bureaucratic institutions in Brussels are siding with a rioting mob in the streets. But it also, in a sense, is an indirect threat to anybody who dissents from the official European line inside the European Union. After all, what is the basis of this protest? That Yanukovych's government refused to sign the association government agreement with the EU. And that sparked the protest. So, in other words, Yanukovych's uh, 
negative rating for the EU and for the Americans is that he didn't do what we wanted. But what if a government inside the EU was to begin to say we don't entirely agree with this or that? Would they also see a sponsored crowd on the streets? Would they also see inside countries, inside the EU, uh, a threat to the constitutional order if you don't follow the line that the bureaucrats in Brussels have laid down? So I think we're seeing not a promotion of democracy here, but in fact a sinister and rather cynical power political game about the Ukraine, but one which has implications for the functioning of the constitutions of Western Europe, for the functionings of our own democracy. Maybe it will pass, maybe it's just a flash in the pan, but it does reveal a rather contemptuous attitude towards elections and towards democratic procedures on the part of the elite in Brussels and, I have to say, also in Washington. All right, uh, Professor Mark Armand, live uh, from uh, Oxford. Uh, Mr. Armand, thank you very much indeed, as always, for sharing your views with us. And uh, 